Welcome to the Maximize Business Value Podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Mastery Partners, where our mission is to equip business owners to maximize business value so they can transition their business on their terms. Our mission was born from the lessons we've learned from over 100 business transactions, which fuels our desire to share our experiences and wisdom so you can succeed. Now here's your host, CEO of Mastery Partners, Tom Bronson. Hi, this is Tom Bronson, and welcome to Maximize Business Value, a podcast for business owners who are passionate about building long-term sustainable value in their businesses. In this episode, I'd like to welcome our guest, John Gorbett, who's principal at the Gorbett Group and a partner with us here at Mastery Partners. He's really kind of the brains behind the operation. Brains and beauty, you'll learn that uh, more in a minute. John and I have worked together for nearly 25 years Uh, First, when we were partnered on a team after both of our companies were acquired in the 90s, and then as collaborators in other businesses. John has done pre-acquisition due diligence and post-acquisition integrations for many years and probably knows more about business transactions than anybody on the planet except me, of course. Uh, Today, we're going to tap into his vast knowledge and expertise regarding preparing a business that will eventually transition because all businesses will eventually transition, whether we want them to or not. So welcome to Maximize Business Value, John. How are you? Hey, I'm doing great. Great to be here, Tom. It's awesome to have you with us. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, look, I know, I know all the dark, deep secrets. Let's just tell them a little bit about yourself. Yeah, you know, if I used one word, it'd have to be Superman, but that's already been taken. So let's just go with a few more words. <laughs> um, like you said, I've done a lot of business integrations. I, I do a lot now. I'm really a, a boots on the ground person that gets engaged in business assesses it, figures out what's going on with it, looks where we need to make improvements, make those improvements, and then train people and move on. Um, So I spend a lot of time from the due diligence side, even if it's not for a sale, but getting into a company and understanding it with the hopes of, a lot of owners would tell me in the past that I knew their business better than they did, but it's only because I looked at every little piece and they rely on other people to, to look at those pieces. So, um, I, you know, like I said, did that for years, and now I do it for a lot of uh, private equity firms. Awesome. Awesome. Mm-hmm. That's, that is uh, so important, and you bring up an excellent point there. You know, business owners who have delegated things um, uh, sort of sometimes lose track of those things, and so they need occasionally someone like you, and, and that's, of course, what we do at Mastery Partners as well. Yeah. Uh, to to kind of uncover those things to to make the, those improvements. So so what is your background and why did you get so heavily involved in mergers and acquisition work? Boy, that's you know my background was really more operational, but I really like to understand a business from start to finish. And you know when, when my company and yours got acquired years ago, um, I started helping they acquire with operations, but then realized, Hey, I can, I can really get in and make a difference across the board. And I don't like to just do that one widget thing. So, you know, getting into the due diligence side of it allowed me to look at the accounting side, look at the operational side, regulatory side, sales sides, and just dig in and understand, you know, all companies are basically the same from a sales gross profit expenses and hopefully money at the bottom line, but they all have such intricacies that make them so unique. So I like getting in there and figuring out what those are. What makes that company unique? Can it be duplicated? Um, How do we measure it? You know, it's really key and making sure people understand their business. That's uh, that is brilliant because it's I mean, it's all about the details. Right. And, and you are so right. You know, as I as I talk with uh, prospective uh, clients, regardless of what their industry is, and I know you've worked in many, many industries uh, through the years, uh, I always say you can put a business every business in America, you can put it into a box. 
And at the top of that box is what they do. Let's call it 15%, whether they're, whether they're a, a bank or a restaurant or, or a, a manufacturing company, this is what they do. Underneath that, the 85% that makes the business hum, it, all businesses look the same. Now, now, they may have nuance to the process, but it's all about sales and marketing and operations and finance and, and, uh, and uh, planning and all of that stuff. And that's really where we get into the weeds. I tell folks, we're never going to be an ag- expert at that top 15%. This is where we can really impact your business. Do you agree with that statement? Definitely, because not only, you know, once you start digging into that and then from years of experience with other companies, other industries, now we have things to benchmark off of. You know, the, you might, somebody might go, oh, I think I'm doing great here. And I'm like, well, yeah, you're doing great, but you actually could do better. And, and here's some things that other companies do. So you can bring in things where most business owners don't have time to go sit with people and say, hey, how are you uh, processing this? Or, how, you know, what kind of controls do you have in place? They're too busy with day to day. And so we can go in and analyze that and do look at that kind of stuff and then create new processes and show them how to just make tweaks to make life a little better and more profitable and maybe make some profit happen, not by accident. Yeah. Well, there you go. I mean, that you're, you're bang on. I, as I used to say in the restaurant business, you know, if the owner is the guy that's stirring the sauce all day, making the sauce and stirring the sauce, he doesn't take time to step back and really work on his business. And that's the kind of things that you're talking about. Now, before we jump into some of the improvements that, uh, that, we, that, that you can make or things that you can see in a business, I want to talk about um, when a business actually makes that transition. If they sell to a third party or, or even sell internally to, to family or, or uh, management teams, uh, they go through a process called due diligence. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, so uh, can you give our listeners and viewers a little insight into what is due diligence? You know, due diligence, most, some people think it's a tooth extraction, but it's not. It's, it's, well, it's a root canal is what it yeah. is without any Novocaine, in my opinion, but uh, I'll let you make your exactly. own. It's really going through and looking over every aspect of your business, digging into the legal side to make sure that um, maybe you had a partner at one time and you guys split, but that guy never signed his final piece of paper. I've had that happen. And all of a sudden it changes when you're trying to sell your business. So it's going through and looking at creditors, whether or not you've got liens cleared, you know, just, the whole business aspect um, at your employees. Are there any potential risks there? So it's due diligence goes into every aspect of the business from finance to operations to HR. Um, You know, I have a list probably about 175, 180 questions that I go in and ask. And some of them are unique to certain industries, but most of them are across the board and they are designed and, and, and we've got the same kind of package, you know, at Mastery to bring out areas of concern that, you know, the, whoever's going to be buying the company, if they find them, now it's a bigger issue. So let's address them ahead of time so we know it's there. If we need to spend some time to fix it before you sell it, then let's do that. So that's, I think due diligence is just key to get in and start looking at instead of putting yourself on the market and then finding out, Oh, I'm going to take a hit because I could have fixed this problem. Well, so you, so you brought up a couple of great points there. Uh, The, our transition readiness assessment, which we do at mastery is sort of a due diligence list on steroids. It's about 500 questions that we have through to make sure that things are done properly because you really want to do that in advance because uh, we joke about uh, due diligence being a tooth extraction or whatnot. It sometimes can be a dumpster fire. Uh, it really can be. And I know you've seen situations where it is that you uncover things that you just don't expect uh, yeah. during that due diligence. The business is not prepared to produce those documents. Uh, I don't want to waylay this because we're going to talk about this on our live webinar uh, coming up on Thursday. Uh, but uh, but it's... Um, uh, 
as I put it to most business owners, you know, selling a business is a once in a lifetime event for most business owners. Most people haven't been involved in as many transactions as you and I have. And I, I've, I've lost count for you. I know I've done a hundred transactions. You've done, you've done yeah. number, right. And so, um, uh, but uh, a lot of times during an acquisition, due diligence is where the wheels come off. And where even though you've agreed to a price, you've agreed to how you're going to do this during due diligence, that's where the whole thing falls apart and the sale uh, never actually transpires. I say, and I'll catch a lot of flack uh, from, from uh, my friends that buy businesses uh, about this uh, in, uh, in private equity and, and uh, venture capital, but due diligence is designed to lower the price uh, and because they find things that they don't expect. And, and so the point is, is the more that you're prepared and the more you disclose in the beginning, you can reduce the chance of those things happening. So uh, enough about uh, due diligence. Okay, so let's get into some of the nuts and bolts. Uh, as you already know, when we first engage with a client, one of the first things we ask is whether or not their corporate records are up to date. Why is that so important for a business that wants to eventually transition? Well, the real key is once they, once they go to transition, they're going to have people come in looking, legal people coming in, making sure that everything's all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted, but they're going to go through all those paperwork and make sure that the company doesn't have any outstanding liens. They don't have any regulatory filings that haven't been done that all the shareholders, you understand who the shareholders are, what their, their voice is, uh, I worked a deal one time where we got all the way to the closing and there were four family members and two were involved in the business, two weren't, and the two that weren't had no idea the business was being sold and they stopped it. So making sure that you've got all that shareholder you know, in sync, everybody's walking the same way, everything's properly filed, um, that there's no open loops there, just because you run it all the time and you think, oh, I'm going to sell this, make a million, and I'll give half a million to my sister. She's going to be fine with it. She might not be fine with it. She's kind of used to getting that check every year. So making sure all that shareholder piece is tied up is, is very big. Yeah. It's huge. Well, so, so uh, in, the, in the times that, that we were doing acquisitions, and we did many uh, together, uh, and, uh, and some that, uh, that I did in other businesses, one of the first things that I would look at during due diligence was the corporate records. I want to know, first of all, and, and to me, if all the records are in order and it looked clean, that was a clue that we were going to have a really good, clean due diligence. And if they were a mess, that was a clue that I need to dig really deep here. Does, does that make sense to you? Does that, is that something that you think about as well? Oh yeah. I mean, if, if they haven't been having, you know, shareholder meetings, recording notes where they're talking about what's going on, the growth of the company. Um, that's a sign that, you know, they're busy taking care of customers, but they might not be taking care of the company. You know, and so that is a, a definite sign. To, that's one of the first things is to go in and look at the corporate uh, structure and look at all the records and just what's going on there and what has, how's it been taken care of. And okay. Well, and just to be clear, uh, not every kind of corporate structure requires a book, right? You know, the big corporate um, book with the seal and all that, but some do. Uh, but even though, for example, an LLC is not required to keep uh, annual um, shareholder minutes or board minutes, um, it's just good practice, right? Um, I, I think it's good practice. And I, and I really work to tell our clients, even though it's not required as a legal mandate, it's probably a good idea to keep those things. Do you agree with that? I agree because, I mean, it shows you're taking the time to look at your business. If it's only once a year. Um, because it's hard, it, business just gets away from you, taking care of the customer. And that's, that, you think that that's the right thing. And it is. But at the same time, if you're not looking at your business and understanding where it's been and where you want to go and kind of documenting that process, which is just, you know, we'll probably talk a little about that because that's just everything being documented makes life so much easier as you go through due diligence and go through a sale. Um, 
but I, I think that's, it's necessary. It's, like you said, it's not always legal requirement, but if people are doing that, they're understanding their business a little better. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And of course, yeah, I, I, folks that realize that they don't have to have that, then I'll ask another follow-up question, something like, well, where do you keep your corporate resolutions? And almost always they say, well, I don't have any corporate resolutions. And so I'll ask, hey, do you have a loan at the bank? Do you have a line of credit at the bank? Yes, I do. Well, in the documents you signed, there was a corporate resolution that should be a part of your minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and every bank on the planet requires a corporate resolution authorizing the company to borrow the funds. And so, so even if you have those, that's, that's something that needs to be to, to keep your record book uh, up to date uh, always. It, you can always go back and recreate this, but I can tell you uh, in many businesses, I mean, it's many, many, many hours of trying to gather and put this stuff. It's just better to have a process to keep all of that stuff in place at the beginning. Do it along the way. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So what do you think about identifying and tracking KPIs or for our listeners, key performance indicators or key operating metrics on a daily or weekly basis? You know, I, I think it's a, a lot like people say that, you know, if you don't have a map and a path to get someplace, you're going to travel all over and maybe never get to your, your in place. And, and the KPIs, you know, working on, like I said, I work a lot with private equity firms and they tend to live and die by KPIs. And so they're measuring all the time. And, and you can measure to the point where you just, all you're doing is making measurements. Uh, or you're taking too long to get the results and everything's passed. So for a company to set up some key performance indicators that they can collect the data easily and they can track it and trend it. So then they can see, Oh, wait a minute. Every, uh, in the fall, I'm always a little, you know, I have run more overtime because too many people are taking vacation during this time and, and my orders are really high, but you can start doing some analysis. So, you know, operationally, you can, you know, you can look at uh, labor cost uh, for putting out a product. You can look at the material cost to put a product per hour. Uh, look at fill rates, customer complaints, but tracking those KPIs and then executing on them is really key. You can't, you know, wait two months to get performance indicators and then think you're gonna change anything. Um, there's key ones you can look at in HR, there's finance ones you can look at. You know, the standards are like, you know, your day's sales outstanding, your days that your payables are out, but how long does it take you to, for cash conversion? A lot of small companies need to be looking at that. Otherwise, you know, if they don't have a big bank line they can always pull from, things are tight. Well, then you need to understand that cash conversion metric and how quickly does your money turn into cash and so you can, can stay afloat. So. I think there's a number of things, like I said, you don't want to get overwhelmed with too many, but there's a few in kind of each function of the business that are really key to look at. So as you, uh, as you already know, in, in our businesses, we always set up KPIs kind of by department. What were our support numbers? You know, how quickly were we answering and resolving calls? Uh, and, and sales, you know, what is our conversion rate of leads converting to sales? Uh, in marketing, what was our uh, conversion rate of, of marketing leads that convert into uh, opportunities? Of course, then it goes over to sales. How many, uh, how many leads do we get at a, at a trade show? I, I really think that KPIs are something that you can set up in every single department but then again, as the business owner, I think you pick the two or three of each of those departments, and you probably then have a dozen KPIs that you're looking at on a, on a weekly basis to see what's going on. And underneath that, maybe the department is measuring other things. And so if you see a change in, a, in the KPI, if it normally is this and suddenly it goes to this, then perhaps you have more detail underneath that. But but. Um, you know, a lot of business owners will set up KPIs, but then not track them and not pay any attention to them. Oh, can't we just review those at year end? Does that make any sense to you? Oh, uh, I see it all the time. It, you know, they'll track them and they'll be like, oh, yeah, they're over here. And I'm like, well, 
if, if you look, you see the spike here. Did you see that? And they're like, well, we don't really look at them. You know? And so they need to be looked at and they need to be thought about as forecasting going forward. So if you're going to suddenly think you're going to increase sales, well, what do I think my ratio should be with those increased sales now? How does that affect them? Uh, or if you change a major product mix, uh, those kind of help keep you in line. And so all of a sudden, when you get at the end of that month, you know what you were expecting to get and then what showed up. So it's, again, it gets back to a lot of, there's a lot going on, but if you get that down to a limited number that, you know, it gets published out and daily, weekly, however you can capture that information, uh, and you just take a minute to glance at it first thing in the morning. You go, okay, things ran good yesterday. You know, things have been good for this week. It'll make a world of difference in uncovering problems early. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so at bare minimum, um, I recommend that uh, businesses set up KPIs in finance. I mean, because that's where the money is, right? Uh, and, and so you ticked off a few. Let's, let's just uh, name a, a couple. One of my favorites is cash on hand. I want to know what's the cash in the bank, right? But then that impacts that you mentioned AR and AP. How do you, what, what would be some good KPIs for those? For uh, days sales outstanding, days payables outstanding. So then you're going to start seeing whether or not your payables are lagging, you know, because you've got people off paying, but they might not be paying as fast as you think they're paying because uh, you're not looking at every single invoice. Uh, you might be looking at inventory days, inventory values that, that are on hand. Uh, if you're a manufacturing company, it, it's really key to start looking at, you know, labor per like pound, say if you're processing any type of uh, food or something, that, what's the labor dollars going into each pound? What's the overtime dollars, material costs? Uh, those are big to see if something's happening in your process that's suddenly causing more labor to go in uh, to generate out the same amount of product at the end of the month. So you might be selling it, but you're putting in a lot more cost. So those are going to show you those things. Um, and of course with sales, you're looking at gross profit and overall cost and sales by category. And um, Oh yeah. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's, there's a million of them to choose from, but I think the, maybe the key is for, for you to go through, we go through a process at mastery uh, to, to help identify what are those key things. Right that when they move, it impacts the business, either positive or negative. You know, if you have a spike in sales, it, it may be good, but if you don't realize that that spike in sales and maybe that impacts the cash, are we thinking down the line to production? Do we need, do we have enough capacity to meet this spike in sales? So those are the kind of things that, that we try to walk through and, and help our uh, clients understand. That's, we, in fact, we're going to talk about that when we do our live webinar um, uh, later this week uh, from when this uh, podcast is published. So we're talking with John Gorbett. We're having a good time. Let's take a quick break back in 30 seconds. Good. Mastery Partners equips business owners to maximize business value so they can transition on their own terms using our four-step process. We start with a snapshot of where your business is today. Then, we help you understand where you want to be and design a custom strategy to get you there. Next, you execute that strategy with the help of our amazing resource network. And ultimately, we help you transition your business on your terms. What are you waiting for? More time? More revenue? If you want to maximize your business value, it takes time. Now is the time. Get started today by checking us out at masterypartners.com or email us at info at masterypartners.com to learn more. We're back with John Gorbett, principal at the Gorbett Group and partner here at Mastery Partners. And we're talk about, uh, talking about maximizing business value in operations and finance. And we wandered all over the place uh, in the first half. So, uh, so uh, we did a podcast uh, here at, at uh, Maximize Business Value a couple of weeks ago with Charlene Aldridge and Todd Hunter with Aldridge Kerr, where we talked about the value of documenting 
processes. So can you tell us, John, from your perspective, why every business should do that and kind of what are the benefits from having documented processes? Yes, there's, there's a couple of just pieces. I mean, you have employees, they're great employees, they're doing things along the way, or, or your CFO um, has got his processes in place, and then suddenly he leaves. Well, if you don't have basic processes down pat to, to follow up, all of a sudden, whoever comes in, they'll eventually figure it out. And I recently did a, a job where I, I stepped in and he left me at two or three things and I found out that there were two or 300 things, but, um, and there's a lot of things that he had had the job five, six years. So he just naturally did them. Nothing was documented. And what happens is you won't even know you're missing it till something goes awry. All of a sudden you get a phone call. It's like, Hey, you haven't submitted this record or you haven't filed. It's like, I didn't even know we did that. Um, and so then you go back and you're like, oh, yeah, yep, it's not back there. But if you had documented things along the way for all the various functions, now you don't have to be ISO certified, you know, to that level of documentation, but processes along the way just to say, hey, here's how we do everything. Here's what we do. Yeah, I typically, when I go into an organization, one of the first things I like to do is a basic process flow that says, how does an order come in? How does it get out? And take me through the steps and who integrates. And then I lay it out and I can't tell you the number of times I've put it in front of an owner and they're like, oh, I've never thought about it this way. Oh, look at these places where they intersect. And I'm like, right. And that's the ones we got to be concerned about where things intersect and where's the dependencies. Um, and it, they don't look at it. But once you see it on paper, a lot of things pop out and show you things to think about. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, and, and you think about really in any business, there could be hundreds and hundreds of processes and, and it might be a worthwhile exercise to do most of those. But I really think that, that every business owner should go through an exercise to identify what are the critical processes uh, of, of how, how money flows in. You got to have processes around money, right? I, I'm, I never cease to be amazed at, uh, at business owners that have no process for when checks come in the door and what happens next. Yes. Uh, and, and I'll bet you and I have a similar story on that. Uh, when a business was sold um, and the operations manager set up a new bank account. You remember those good old days? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a story for another time. But, uh, but, uh, but you don't, I mean, you don't, have to, it's, it can be a daunting task to set out and do all of your processes. Pick the critical ones. Yeah. What gets product out the door? How does product, how does product move through? How does cash convert into product, you know, and things like that. And, and you should really go through a process to identify those and then, and then relentlessly tick them off. If you sat down to document all of your processes and nothing's documented at all, I mean, it could take, it could be overwhelming. In fact, it, it could prevent you from doing it. But in that example that you just gave, where you walked in, stepped into the shoes of a CFO and only two or three things were documented. I mean, how much effort did it take to actually get to the bottom of, of the abyss? Oh, it, it took months, literally, to find everything. And, and then along the way, we would find where something didn't happen. And we'd be like, well, who does that? And I'd be like, well, Bob does that. Nobody else knows how to do it? Oh, no. Bob's ready to retire. I mean, if Bob leaves, then who's going to do it? So it's finding those things. So then we're like, okay, well, let's get this cross-trained with somebody else. Let's make sure that other people understand how to do this and document it so that at least there's something there. It's a baseline that you can go from and start from. Yeah. So if you document the processes, it makes cross training a little bit easier. I'm glad you brought that up because I'm a firm believer that, that you should cross train everybody. I mean, everybody should be able to do some other folks jobs and that includes the functions of the owner. If the owner does something exclusively, 
man, you, you, if, even if you don't want somebody else to do those things, I think that the owner should spend the time to really document those so that if something happens, somebody else could do them. What do you think about that? Oh, I think it's key because who would have thought we'd have this COVID world that we have now. And all of a sudden I have a person that does something or the owner and I have to go out and isolate, you know, and I can call, but it's still not the same. Or if I get sick, you're not up to calling. And without doing some cross training, all of a sudden you can find yourself really, really shorthanded. Um, and I think in today's world, it's even more important to cross train. You know, we do have the availability of conference calls, you know, and video calls, but assuming people are available to do that, but that cross training just makes it so much easier. Somebody else can step in and help out and lend a hand while somebody's out for a few days or weeks. I have a great example of that. Uh, I've got a, a, a client that's, uh, that's older, uh, but also in a risk category for COVID, uh, who uh, was the keeper of uh, at least a dozen or so things that nobody else knew how to do. And I have been encouraging and encouraging them to let's teach somebody else how to do those things. And then when COVID hit, and this business owner could not come back to the business because they were in a risk category and didn't want to be exposed. It forced them into having to teach somebody how to do this stuff over the phone. It was difficult and laborsome to do it, but now it's all documented. Hallelujah. Right. So there's yeah. a, a side benefit uh, to doing that. Um, um, let's talk about some of our listeners uh, maintain inventory in their business. And, and that's an area where I think too many businesses get a little bit lax. How frequently should they be doing inventory cycle counts and, and why? What's the benefit of doing that? You know, I guess the benefits are multifold. One, um, you don't catch yourself. Well, you're inventorying finished goods and you also inventory your raw product. So you don't want to catch yourself thinking you can make a sale and promising a customer and it's really not there because somebody miscounted somebody somewhere along the way, the workers got off and customer calls in as your good customer and he wants this, you're like, yeah, I've got it. And now you go back out and find out you don't and it's a three week lead time. That's building some bad relationship. Same with getting product in. You think you can run, a, run your lines, but you don't have enough and all of a sudden you might stop and now you're, you got employees that aren't working and machines aren't running. So I think inventory absolutely have to do a full inventory on an annual basis, but depending upon the volatility and how tight you run, if you're running a just in time, well then you might be wanting to cycle count every week pieces, you know, this product being done, these ingredients this week or this finished goods this week. And so that at least every month you've made your way through a warehouse and just do pieces at a time, that's a lot easier to chew than shutting things down because some companies do inventory without shutting down. And that's just a bad inventory because you just, no matter how hard you try, things are going to get missed and it is going to show up in adjustments and you might get a big swing one month and a big swing the other direction the next month. So I think cycle counting is a great way to accomplish it and do it in small pieces. Guys can come in if they're just counting a couple of racks and figure out what's there and then chew up. And then, you know, I like doing a, at least a quarterly um, inventory, but a lot of it so much begins on me and how much in inventory they have and how much, how much it turns and um, how tight they run. You know, if they've got a, enough safety stock that they can go for weeks, then that's one thing, but most people don't. Um, yeah. Do it, it's huge. And, and the smaller, the look, big businesses have ways of electronically tracking that stuff and the smaller the business, the more they let that go. And, and it really messes up your balance sheet, right? Um, many times you come in and I'll look at a, at a balance sheet and there'll be, you know, 
$200,000 in inventory and you, okay, show me, you know, where is that? Uh, and it's stuff that's, that's either obsolete or no good. And, and it just, it, it really can impact long-term value of the business. So it's really important to keep up with, uh, with inventory. So. And it can also affect, you know, a lot of people have loans and they, then they're borrowing on their inventory. And so if that's inaccurate, you're misrepresenting to your bank. And so if a bank, which typically they have the right to come in and run an inventory and suddenly find that they've been lending you inventory on inventory that's not there, which I've seen, an inventory that's not usable, now you might find yourself in a financial crunch because suddenly your loan changes. Yeah. So I, I think it's yeah. a really yeah, if you have a line, if you have a line of credit, uh, you typically might have to submit a, a borrowing base a certificate uh, on a routine basis, and so they want to know. And by the way, when you sign those, that is a legal agreement, and if you signed it knowing full well that it's wrong, uh, they could pull your line uh, from you. That breaks your bank covenants, and so uh, super, super important to do that. We've we've kind of wandered all over the place uh, in operations here today, and it's been a lot of fun. But I do have one last question for you. Yeah. This podcast is what's that? <laughs> I'm worried. What's the last question? All right, yeah, here we go. Actually, yeah, I might have one more after that too, because you know I always have a surprise question. Uh, but this podcast is all about maximizing business value, and I know. John, you've been in so many different kinds of businesses, even businesses that I know about. I, I know that you've been in many more that I don't know anything about. So what is the one most important thing you recommend business owners do to build long-term sustainable value in their business? Boy, narrow it down to one. There's so many. Uh, you know, I, I think getting in, you know, we talked about, diligence and understanding your business, but getting in and understanding what you're selling and what it costs. And it might be, you might have 20 items, but look at each of those and understand, okay, what, what do I make off of this? Because what happens, tends to happen, I see it a lot. Companies have favorite customers and the customer says, well, like, can you do this? Can you do this? Can you make this new formula? And all of a sudden a company is producing something, selling a lot of it, not making any money off it. In some cases they're losing money. So I think truly going in and understanding how you make your money and off of what you make your money on is a, a key in maximizing the value of your business. Well, that's, that, that's brilliant. That just stands right on its own. You shock me, you know, you can't put something smart. Uh, that no, all kidding aside, that is so important to know where and how you make your money. And so many businesses can't articulate that, uh, because the financial statements don't reveal it. Uh, we'll just let that one hang in the, in the air there. I mean, that's figure out how you make your money and, and where you make your money. That's totally brilliant. Um, but I, as you might imagine for our listeners, they all know this. Um, you get a bonus question too, and I'll be interested to hear what you say since I've known you for so long. What personality trait has gotten you into the most trouble over the years? Well, I first would say my charming personality, but we won't go down that route. Um, Probably the, the personality. I would agree, by the way, that your charm could have, may have gotten you in trouble through the years. <laughs> I would probably say that I'm, I'm not a very, I'm not good at playing politics in an organization. I'm all about executing and results. So I don't like to play a game and give people answers they want or sound bits that they want to hear. Um, I want to make sure that things are correct and we're executing, they're getting the results they want and we're not stringing people along and giving them information that's not necessarily right, you know. Um, there's so many places you get into and people don't want to report results. Right. And they only want to report good results. They don't want to report results. Um, and sometimes the news isn't good. And so it's a lot better to give the news and say, here's what's happening and here's what we got to go do to fix this. And here's what caused it. Then to say, oh, I'll put this back and I probably can fix that next month or something. 
So um, I'm very much a, here it is, and it might not like it, but it's, it's real. As I always say, you know, throw the dead cat on the table because once you once it's there, you got to deal with it, right? Uh, that's uh, that's brilliant, and you're that's a that is a great answer to that. I can I can tell you multiple times uh, where you and I would get crossways because we worked for a publicly traded company that no longer exists. Uh, that uh, that. They were looking for for rosy news, and we were the bearers of the reality many times. And so, that, I, I can actually suddenly that rush of memories of us both getting in trouble uh, in a couple of those uh, instances. So, uh, thanks for pointing out another one of my character flaws. <laughs> so how can our viewers and listeners get in touch with you? Well, um, you know, they can obviously reach me through. Uh, mastery partners or they can email me at john.gorbit group so it's g-o-r-b-u-t-t g-r-o-u-p at outlook.com so it's awesome. john.gorbit group at outlook.com awesome thank you john this has been a lot of fun more fun than than we should have uh, been able to have today but uh, thanks for coming and being our guest really awesome thanks so you can find John at our website. Uh, instead of this, uh, you know, real life uh, photograph, we've got caricatures and he looks better, uh, I think, uh, on the caricature, just like me, uh, than yes. we do in real life. <laughs> so you can find John on our website or on LinkedIn. Or of course, you can go to the Gorbit group. Uh, but if you, if you really want to reach out to John, uh, reach out to me and I will connect you directly with him. So this is Maximize Business Value Podcast, where we give practical advice to business owners on how to build long-term sustainable value in your business. Be sure to tune in each week and follow us wherever you found this podcast and be sure to comment. We love comments and we respond to all of them. So until next time, I'm Tom Bronson reminding you to focus on the details while you maximize business value. Thank you for tuning in to the Maximize Business Value Podcast with Tom Bronson. This podcast is brought to you by Mastery Partners, where our mission is to equip business owners to maximize business value so they can transition on their own terms. Our mission was born from the lessons we've learned from over 100 business transactions, which fuels our desire to share our experiences and wisdom so you can succeed. Learn more on how to build long-term, sustainable business value and get free value building tools by visiting our website, www.masterypartners.com. That's mastery with a Y, masterypartners.com. Check it out. That was perfect. I wouldn't make any changes on that.